Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Yang kinchi dukhang samboti Sabbang vinyana pachaya Vinyana sanivo dena Nati Dugasa Sambhavoti Suttanipata 734 I'll mention a translation of that gata later on in this talk but as I promised last week for this evening's talk I wanted to uh, discuss Dukkha Last week, Anicca, this is the second of the three characteristics uh, which one should use as a means for seeing the truth of this body and this mind. Uh, One can use reflections on the five candors. One can use reflections on (coughs) the sense bases. But whatever what you are focusing on, whatever you are investigating, the whole purpose of insight is to draw out one of these three factors or more than one of these three factors of anicca, dukkha, anatta for a purpose. And that purpose is to develop the the nibbida, turning away from these things and to be able to be free from these things. One of the reasons why that we haven't got freedom from things is that because we don't see fully just how these things which we take up, which we grasp, which we crave for, are riddled with anicca, dukkha, anatta, with impermanence, unsatisfactory, non-self, nothing to do with us. If you could only see just how fully each one of these three terms permeates every object of our contemplation, every candor, every sense base, everything which we can conceive and perceive, if we can only see that, then Nibbida would come up as a natural course. One would turn away from these things. The whole reason, the stickiness of craving and of attachment would be taken away. That stickiness is thinking that there's something permanent, something happy, something mine or me involved in those things. So it's using these three characteristics which (coughs) takes away the glue which sticks one to samsara. And this evening I wanted to talk about in particular the second of the characteristics called dukkha. It's perhaps one of the most important but all three are important are all aspects of the same Dhamma, the same truth. But it's perhaps an important one because it was the one which the Buddha first saw. When the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree and became enlightened, it was Dukkha, which was the focus of his teachings. The first teaching, or rather the second teaching which he gave, was the Four Noble Truths. The first teaching was the Middle Way. That middle way, as you all know, was avoiding the extremes of indulging in the world of the five senses. That's karma sukha. And also avoiding, torturing the body, bringing up pain. There's enough pain as it is without trying to search for pain. That was called atta gilamatanu yoga. And there was a middle way between those two, which was basically based on the that which is left out from causing pain (coughs) or causing uh, joy, pleasure of the five senses. What's left out from those two extremes, the middle way, is the pleasure of the mind. That's why the Eightfold Path, which was the middle way, culminates in the pleasures of the mind, the jhanas. That's another uh, talk altogether. The second of the teachings which the Buddha gave was the Four Noble Truths. And later on he'd always say it's because beings don't fully understand these Four Noble Truths that they are stuck in samsara 
always liable to old age, sickness and death, and more birth, old age, sickness and death and the round of samsara, wandering around, filling up the cemeteries, crying tears without end. This is the Buddha's teachings. And when I first came across that, that was actually saying the reason why people aren't stream winners, white returners, non returners and arahats. He's saying if you want to point to anything, it's because that the insights into the Four Noble Truths haven't been completed. <coughs> and the standard definition of awija, ignorance, delusion, illusion, whichever English word you wish to translate that Pali word by, awija, that's always defined in the dependent origination as not understanding the Four Noble Truths. And with full understanding of those Four Noble Truths, Awija is abolished, is done away with, ceases. And with the untangling of Awija, then the whole dependent origination sort of goes to what I call dependent cessation. Everything starts to unravel, disappear and go. But in particular here, it's not fully understanding the first noble truth, which causes people to still cling, search for, hope for, things which are intrinsically suffering. The Buddha said that that first noble truth should be fully understood. To use the word parijanati. To know, but pari, parinyana to fully know, all around, in every particular way. And it's because there's some aspects of dukkha, there's some little areas of our mind, of our body, or the objects of experience, which we still think aren't subject to dukkha. Whatever we think is not subject to dukkha, we will take hold of that, cherish it, crave and attach to it, and that little seed will be the cause of further rebirth and further suffering. So it's actually seeing fully the nature of dukkha, which is important. When the Buddha explained dukkha, sometimes he explained it in three ways. Dukkha, dukkha, and was it Viparinama dukkha and Sankara dukkha. And just noticing there's three little aspects or different types of dukkha. Dukkha dukkha is the ordinary dukkha, which is what most people know and know more. The dukkha of not getting what you want. The dukkha of physical pain. The dukkha of <coughs> impingements on the senses which you'd rather not have. And because that takes up most of the time in a person's life, most of our concerns are with dukkha dukkha, the ordinary suffering of life, of existence. And we don't see that there's something much deeper. We think that if we can only just arrange, control, manipulate, do things a little bit better, that dukkha dukkha, we can sort of somehow escape from that, sometimes even manage it. The pain of the body, we take medicines, because we think we can actually do something with the pain of the body. Maybe sometimes you can sort of get it a little bit better, but then it gets worse again. And sometimes even just getting it better, sometimes a remedy is worse than the, the symptoms, the illness. And it's dukkha dukkha all the time. After a while of looking at, say, the pains in the body, and the difficulty of this body, the old age of this body, as you get weaker and more things start to go wrong. Sometimes you look at this body as a hopeless case. You get nibida towards this body by contemplating the suffering inherent in having a human body, a human form. There's just so many sicknesses which you can get. And as you get older, you get more. And they build up more and more in your body. Every sickness makes you weaker so the next one can run <coughs> uh, 
run longer and more deeply inside this, this body of ours. And eventually we're going to get into old age, nursing homes, death. It's the nature of this, this body. And so it shouldn't be too hard to see the dukkha of having a body. Sometimes we decide to have some pleasure while we're still young and fit. But one thing with the pleasure of the body, the pleasures of seeing movies, watching the TV, having sex, having relationships, going to see this mountain or that waterfall. The Buddha actually said, and this is a, what I always reflect on, he said it's apasuka bahudukha. There is a sort of pleasure there, but it's small and it's mostly suffering. Now we spend so much, or we, we invest so much suffering every time just to get a little bit of happiness. I remember even as a young man just chasing girls, just how much suffering it was just to get one. And then you get one just for a little while and then you know, she leaves you or you don't like her and then you all over again, just so much suffering just for a little bit of pleasure. And that's actually the story of sensory life. So much suffering just for a little bit of pleasure, the suffering beforehand and then afterwards when it goes away. There's another part of that uh, search for pleasure in the world. It's just the craving itself, that people get a taste just for the craving. They're doing something. It's the, <coughs> the pleasure which is involved in hope and planning and expecting. Sometimes when you get a present for your birthday, the best part of it is just seeing it and then unwrapping it. And when you actually open it up and it's yours, the pleasure's gone then. It's just the hope, the expectation. And that's actually looking at the that part of sensory desire, which is not actually getting what you want, or rather achieving your aims, it's just a whole process of getting it. A lot of people get off on the pain of hope. And that's almost like a drug. It's a drug which they think is going to give them pleasure, which they get addicted to, but which wrecks their minds and wrecks their bodies. What people do in this world for a bit of fun just this evening, it's tea time, we were talking, someone said there's, there's a club of people who jump out of high-rise buildings with parachutes. And they said a third of them are already dead. They didn't make it. Imagine doing that just for fun, knowing that you've got one in three chance of dying, you know, just on the fall, just so you could <coughs> jump out of a building top story of a building, open up a parachute, maybe you live, maybe you die, one in three chance of dying. Or there's people in Japan who have this certain type of, I think it's toad or fish or something, which every now and again so many people die. It's almost like a, a weird sort of craving for craving itself. A craving to crave. And so this is a type of suffering of dukkha dukkha which is important to actually to see in the world. What do you want? Or is it just the wanting which you want? And if you look at the wanting you can see that a lot of that is caught up with the idea of being someone, doing something, just being in this realm of samsara. But if you look more closely that's just so much suffering. Why is it especially during meditation times? There's nothing to do. Everything is provided for you. All the requisites of life are there in abundance. We want something more. And the mind disturbs itself by planning, by wanting. It doesn't need anything. It just wants to be involved in craving. Why? Because in craving there is a pleasure. You know the pleasure of craving. Imagine planning something. Planning a trip to the ice cream parlour, or to McDonald's, or to the movies, or wherever you're planning, to holiday somewhere. When they're planning for it, there's pleasure there. But look at the suffering there as well. 
if you can see both, you see it's apasukha, bahudukha. Perhaps the most illustrative example of this was that story which I told last night to the Anagarikas, which was one of Ajahn Jakra's most famous stories. He used to tell it a lot. And that's the, the Nasrudin, the Mullah Nasrudin, eating chilies, you know, red chilies, one after the other. And his face is so red, and just with the eyes just watering, and with mucus just dripping down his nose over his mouth. Just in great agony. Imagine what it's like. Those of you who've got stomach aches, imagine what it's like after about 12 or 13 chilies in your stomach. And his friend said, what are you doing that for? And he said, because I'm looking for the sweet one. And that's actually the story of many people's life, of dukkha dukkha. You're looking for the sweet one. You might go from monastery to monastery. You're looking for the sweet monastery. Teacher to teacher, looking for the sweet one. <coughs> life to life, birth to birth, looking for the sweet one. But all of you know that chilies, there are no sweet chilies. It's all just hot. The five senses are on fire. We're going to chart next week. Just like chilies are on fire. But somehow we think that somewhere there's a sweet one. Somewhere we're going to find just the most comfortable house, partner, job, life. We can plan and fantasize that. And in that planning and fantasizing there is a happiness there, but it's a suffering there as well. And in the achievement of that, you'll find you'll always be disappointed. The two sufferings of life, Oscar Wilde, which is not getting what you want, and the other one is getting what you want. So that's ordinary dukkha dukkha, but it needs to be looked at because this is sometimes what disturbs us in ordinary monastic life. That's why if ever that I am not peaceful, I'm not content, whether it's in my meditation or walking up the meditation path, you know how it is sometimes. You don't feel like sitting meditation, you don't feel like walking meditation, you don't feel like reading the suttas. And of course I always ask that suffering. I always ask myself, what do I want? The cause of suffering, craving. What is it I want? I really go into myself to find out what is it that I want. And I usually identify something which is absolutely really ridiculous, which I can never achieve, never get. But as soon as I see what I really want, I can see that that is suffering. I'm burning myself. I'm looking for a sweet chili, something which never exists. And as soon as you see the stupidity of that craving, it cannot occur. When you're in the world, you want the most, if you're a man, the most beautiful woman, the most beautiful partner. <coughs> when I was a young monk, I think one or two years as a monk, one of the other monks who I'd grown up with decided to disrobe. And so I said, well, what's he disrobing for? He said, why don't I disrobe as well, I thought. And I looked at it and said, do I really want to disrobe? If I want to disrobe, what for? To get a nice woman. And I started thinking, what type of woman would I want? One would always do what I told what I told her. One would always be so sensitive to me. One would always be there for me. This is actually in Singapore, someone told me this story. They wanted to marry someone who would always be entertaining and jolly, would always do what they're told, would be quiet when she wanted them to be quiet, would entertain her when she wanted to be entertained, would always be... Uh, a good companion for her. What she really wanted was a television. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing control, be a good companion, entertain you. She didn't want a man. <laughs> so really, when you actually look at that, when I was looking at that, I said, look, what I want, I will never be able to find. The chilies are hot. People have got defilements. Actually, the what I really started thinking of, the only person, the only woman I could really live with would be an arahat. Someone never complained. But then I thought, what's the point? Because arahats don't have any lust. So I, just, I was just wasting my time. <laughs> so 
So when I started thinking like that, sort of all that sort of desire and stuff, you realize, okay, sometimes desire was there, but it was pointless. It was just almost like echoes from my past. But I would not follow it because who wants to get more suffering in the world? It would never lead me to happiness. I realized that there was some happiness there, but it was apasuka, small amount of happiness, but mostly suffering. And as such, it wasn't good enough. That's that, that this human life as well. Apasuka bahuduka. It's not good enough, this human life. You get all the best part when you're young. And the rest of the life, you have to pay for it. The old age and sickness. And old age starts very early these days. <coughs> so when we actually look at this, we see this is dukkha dukkha. So what you really want, sometimes as the abbot of the monastery, you know, you want every monk to do what you're told. You want every monk to sort of agree with what you speak. And every monk, after you give a talk, to say, sadhu, sadhu, that's a wonderful talk, it's the best talk I've ever heard. You can't have everyone say every week that's the best talk they've ever heard. You can't have everybody agreeing with you. You can't have everybody liking you. You can't have everyone praising you. The loka dhammas, praise and blame. Welcome to the world. Someone blames you and tells you off. They don't like you. That's usual. That's our world. Welcome. If they praise you, welcome again. If you're a pariah in some monasteries, someone who's really off and really weird and strange, welcome to the world. If people think, hold you in great respect and you go and give talks to 3,000 people, welcome to the world. Suffering, happiness, praise and blame, fame and lack of fame and what's the other one? Uh, wealth and poverty. This is part of worldly dumbness. They come and go. Everyone has to have a share of these. That's why this life, this world is just so unsatisfying. And whatever position you have is never satisfying. When I was a young monk, I looked at the senior monks in the line. They were the ones who had the big cushions. And they were Thai monks. And I was a Western monk. I wasn't used to sitting on the hard concrete. And look, in northeast Thailand, the villagers built the monasteries and they couldn't lay concrete. It had bumps in it. It wasn't even smooth. So all these little bumps were sticking into my buttocks as I sat there. And all these big ajans, these big teachers, had all these soft cushions. And I thought, this is unfair. You should give all the big cushions to the junior monks. The same with food as well. I mean, these ajans, these mahateras, they've been monks 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. Now, they've probably got rid of all their defilements right now. They don't need the nice food. It's me who has got my defilements left. I'm the one who needs all the fine food. They should actually let the junior monks choose the food first. They should pass the food up the line, not down the line. And anyway, those big monks were, were big in many ways, they were all fat anyway, so they didn't really need feeding. I was a thin one. And I started, <laughs> started thinking just how much suffering it was being a junior monk. Not only that, I'd always have to be told what to do. There was actually a time, I remember one occasion, one katina. This was at Tam Sangpet. And... They pass the food down the lines. I only got rice. Because all these big adjuncts, they stuffed their bowls full with all the food. And by the time it got down to, to me and a few of the other monks at the end of the line, we got only rice. Nothing else. And I thought, this is really unfair. Wait till I become a senior monk. Now I'm a senior monk, I do the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, it's... I thought that once I become a senior monk, that that would be so good that I won't have any suffering. And this is actually the, the problem of craving. Once we get what we need, or what we want rather, we think there's no more suffering. Once I get it all sorted out, my relationship sorted out, the problem sorted out, once I get control of the situation, once I become abbot of my monastery, then why should I have any suffering? I'm in control. And one of the monks, I think it was Ajahn Lim, he gave this wonderful talk so many years ago, which I remember. 
He said, junior monks have junior monk dukkha. Anagarikas have Anagarika dukkha. Middle monks have middle monk dukkha. Second monks have second monk dukkha. And abbots have abbot dukkha. It's true, those of you who are Anagarikas, when you become a monk, if you become a monk, you get rid of a lot of Anagarika dukkha. No kitchen work anymore, no driving, no digging, but then you'll get young monk dukkha instead. You've got that to look forward to. Those of you who are young monks who think, when I get a few range retreats under me, get up the line a bit, then I won't you know, have that dukkha anymore. It's true, the young monk dukkha you'll abandon. Then you get middle monk dukkha instead. When you go up the line even further and you get a bit more authority, when you become second monk, you get second monk dukkha. I had second monk dukkha for years under Ajahn Chakra. But now I haven't got that dukkha anymore. I haven't got second monk dukkha. I was second monk for so long, I knew all the tricks of being a second monk. I told a few of them, but I'm not going to tell all of them because otherwise you'll use them on me. <laughs> but once you become abbot, you're the abbot dukkha. Wherever you are in this world, when you're working, you've got working dukkha. When you retire, you've got retirement dukkha. Young, young man's dukkha. <coughs> Middle-aged men, middle-aged dukkha. Old, old dukkha. Poor, you've got poor dukkha. Rich, you've got rich man's dukkha. Look at that. So why do you want to just change one form of dukkha for another form of dukkha? Is that really what you want? Is that really the way out? Really, all you're doing is like the person in a prison. Just changing torturers. Changing cells within the prison. You're just changing one method of torture for another method of torture. If you want to be rich, if you want to have a relationship, you get relationship dukkha. If you're single, you have single dukkha. But all of those things that the Buddha was saying that you can get a way out of this prison of dukkha. But it's not an easy way to get out. It's a very hard, and not many people make it out of this prison. Because so the five sense world is the first of the prisons which people find themselves in. When you have senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, because of the impermanence, non-self nature of the world, the senses will always be changing from pleasure to pain, from beauty to ugliness, from happiness to whatever. When I was in Thailand as a young monk, the food at the beginning was disgusting. You've all heard me tell those stories about the food. And the monks in those early years were all travellers. We'd been many places through the world, many third world countries. Some had been through Africa, I'd been through Central America. I'd also been through uh, much of Asia. People had been all over the place. And when we actually talked together, we, we came to a conclusion that the food in the northeast of Thailand was the worst in the whole world. And it was, it was true. I mean, you couldn't get much worse. It wasn't just that you, eat, you ate sort of rotten things. It was just the way it was cooked was rotten. And you could do much more to a frog than just put it in some boiling water and just serve it to the monks. You could put a bit of sauce or something in it, some salt or something. But so the North Easterners didn't seem to care. And so it was just a worse tasting food. But of course, after a while, you know, you know this story, you started to enjoy it. It was amazing some of the stuff which I started to enjoy and look forward to. And these days I, I just, I couldn't eat it. It's so disgusting. Why was that? And again, it's because whatever food you have, if today it's slightly better than yesterday, that's called delicious. If it's slightly worse than yesterday, then you complain. 
It doesn't matter how good it is or how bad it is, the pleasure of even taste is relative. And that's the same with all of the senses. Even the talks which you give. If I give just brilliant talks, I can't give brilliant talks every week because it's all relative. It's a bit better than the talk yet last week, then it's brilliant. If it's not quite up to the standard, then it's not so good. We always, goodness, badness, pressure, pain, this is relative, part of the duality, which shows that through the senses, those five sense world, it's impossible. It cannot happen that you can get happiness there. There'll be change, anicca, and that change is out of your control, anatta. You will get pleasure in the body and pain in the body. I'm just overhearing just uh, tea time, talking about sitting through pain. Isn't it true that the monks have done that? They sit through pain many hours, the beginning of the night, and the end of the night they sit through bliss. It's very common. The ending of that pain is bliss. The ending of the bliss is pain. It's just noticing those Vedanas. Those Vedanas are always changing, whatever you do. Understanding this shows that there is what's called Viparinama Dukkha. Viparinama means change. It's the Dukkha associated with change. The hopelessness of trying to find real happiness and satisfaction in this world. Really contemplate that. You're in the five sense world most of the time in this monastery. Unless you access jhanas, you're stuck in that world. In this world, in this monastery, if you leave this monastery, if you're working outside, living at home, living here wherever you are, it's going to be very imperfect. You're going to have a huge amount of suffering in your life. And some happiness as well. It has to be that way. If you look at this clearly, not just with the um, stupidity of um, denial. We want the world to be happy. We want the world to be perfect. And so when it's not perfect, we think that someone's made a mistake. We blame ourselves or blame other people. That blaming is just denial. You can't blame yourself. You can't blame other people. This is the way this world actually is. It's not really up to you whether you're smart or stupid, whether people make mistakes or don't make mistakes. This is part of the sensory realm. When actually you see that clearly, you realize that trying to find happiness in this world trying to fix up this world, trying to solve the problems in this world, trying to do social work, trying to set up organizations to stop the exploitation of this group or that group. It's nice to do, but it's pretty hopeless. It's like the person being born in a prison, not knowing anything else other than prison, and spending their whole life just trying to make the prison cell a little bit more comfortable. Painting the prison cells. Putting flower pots with nice flowers on the cell windows. No matter how much you paint the prisons, prison is prison. Every prisoner, if they had the chance, would like to escape, except those who get institutionalized, who don't know any different. This is what most of us spend our life doing. Trying to think, well, prison isn't all that bad. You know, the torture, you know, it's only you know, every 20%, 30%, 40%, 60%, we have fun. Really, if you were in a jail, you only got tortured, sort of what, so eight hours of the day, and 16 hours of the day, you could do whatever you want. Would you really be happy? Is that really a good deal? 
What happens if it's a better deal? Say, 18 hours of the day, only 6 hours of torture. Or 20 hours of the day, and only 4 hours of torture. Or you know, 23 hours of fun and 1 hour of torture. Or say, 30 years of fun, and then you get your torture for the last 20 years of your life. Or the last 10 years. Is that really good enough for you? point is that people who are Aryas see that the place where you're born in is a place called a prison. You're tortured by the five senses, which are beyond your control. They give you happiness and then they give you suffering. The person who actually built this, or not built, who laid the bricks in this hall, he was an old man. He was in the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. He told me that just towards the end of the war, he went on a bombing raid over Germany. His plane got shot and they had to jump out. And being sort of scared, instead of waiting with all the other crew, he jumped out too early and landed in enemy territory. All the other ones, they waited a bit longer and they all fell in the, uh, in the English lines. But he got captured. He got captured by uh, the German uh, military. And he said, <laughs> I don't know if they, don't, they didn't see movies in those days, but you know, you'd all recognize this. They had the good guy and the bad guy, he said. And this bad guy was interrogating him, asking where he came from and what was going on. And then, after being interrogated for a while, this other German soldier came in and said, Ah, you know, just we're all soldiers together. And he said, I've got you something to eat. And he said it was like roast beef and potatoes and gravy and like peas and everything he could ever want as an Englishman. And he put it right in front of him. <laughs> and he was just about to tuck it. He said, like, this good guy, you enjoy it. And then the bad guy came in and said, what are you doing? And he threw the plate to the floor. <laughs> just, just out of Hollywood. <laughs> but he said it actually happened. He didn't know better at the time. He got really upset. And this is <laughs> just torture, isn't it? That's, a, that's how people get tortured. Putting happiness in front of you, almost in your reach. And then you find you can't get it. So that five sense world is like that. Don't buy into that realm. In this monastery, we live in that realm all the time. You can never get the food you like. You can never get the kuti you like. You can never get the weather you like. You can never get the sleep you want. You can never get the health and the body you like. You can't get it. It'd be wonderful if it's an app, I can give you everything you wanted. It's impossible to do that. That's why I don't mind pampering, because I can't fulfill what you want. No one can neither in this life or any other life. The Viparinama Dukkha just shows you just the, the hopelessness of this life. And if you don't know anything more, a lot of times people just say, okay, well, you know, this is life, just make the best of it. Yeah, you know, there's going to be a bit of suffering, but, you know, why not just try the best you can, just take the rough with the smooth, that's life. But the point is that Buddha said there is something more than that. There is something different than that. And this is actually where the Sankara Dukkha can be investigated. Only if you've let go of that five sense world. The sense world of sight, sound, smell, taste, bodily touch. I say that the whole purpose of the Eightfold Path is to get you, first of all, when well, its first purpose is to get you out of the five sense world, to give you a different perspective, to get into the world of mind, of the sixth sense, the Rupa Loka or Arupa Loka, instead of Karma Loka. This world is Karma Loka. It's not a very high realm to be in. It gets into Rupaloka, Arupaloka, in the jhana realms. One tricks you into getting into these realms just because of the sheer fun of it. 
I was saying to the Anagarikas last night, the jhanas are a poison with a sweet taste. They poison the defilements, they poison the self, they poison craving. And especially poison the self. Why would you want to poison the self? Just because it's so sweet. The sweetness of those states is what will take you past the fear of knowing that you're killing something deep inside of you. But it's only illusion, it's not a real thing you're killing. You're killing <coughs> the delusion of me and mine. If you don't do it through the sweetness of the experience, you can do it out of faith. Faith in the teachers you know who have done that, who have gone through the other side, and they were fine. And actually more than fine. When a person does get into the deep meditation, the jhanas, it's extremely blissful. And sometimes people ask, well, what's that got to do with seeing dukkha? It's got everything to do with seeing dukkha. Because reflecting afterwards, why is that bliss? Where did that come from? Or what we say in Buddhism, what caused it? Everything has its cause, has its origin. The origin of the happiness of jhanas is vivi chehi kamehi. Having been left the five sense world and all the akusala dhammas which go along with that. Having got out of prison on parole. Sure, the jhanas are temporary releases in the same way <coughs> that parole is a temporary release. Just out of compassionate leave, just for a few days. But when you get out of jail, for the very first time in your existence, not only is it extremely pleasurable, but you're seeing something which you could never conceive of before. A person who's born in jail, brought up in jail, lived up all their life in jail, just cannot conceive what it's like to be outside. In the same way, a person who has lived all their life in the five sense realm cannot even conceive what a jhana is like. When you achieve a jhana, you will understand that. This is weird, this is strange, this is real and highly pleasurable. You've left the five sense world. You realize that it's pleasurable because you've let go of a lot of sankhara dukkha. This five sense realm, when you let go of it, it's so much nicer. The best pleasure you can experience in this world is when you leave the world. That has an enormous effect on your five candors, on your view and on your perception. Now you can actually see your perception has got something to compare this five sense realm with. And perception, after a journey, you come back and look at this, this five sense realm and you think, why have I spent so much time sort of trying to mess around in this realm? Trying to make kutis, build monasteries, teach people, do things, trying to mess around in this, this realm. Really what I should be doing is just trying to get as many people as I possibly can to try and come and join me in jhanas. So actually to see what I see, to see an alternative, a different perspective, so they can see this five sense realm and have nibida towards it, have nibida towards all the beautiful flowers, have nibida towards the amazing sunsets, have nibida to the lovely little joeys in the pouches. Nibida means revulsion. A lot of times people think, you're crazy. How can you sort of have revulsion to these wonderful things in the life? 
you monks are weird, strange, repressed, you should go and see therapists. Anyone who says that, you know, seeing a beautiful sunset, just what a pain. Just beautiful flowers, yuck. People think you're weird. But this is the truth of things. Nibbada comes when you see something, a pain, a disease, a boil, which you've cherished all this, all this life, and now you see just what it truly is. And then you want out. Nibbida is wanting out. Viraga comes from the development of such Nibbida. Viraga means the fading away of interest in that realm. It's not concerned so much with the world anymore. And all the beautiful little girls in the world, I just flipped through that newspaper down in the office today, in the central pages, there's unclothed women in there. Yuck! Why would you want to mess around in that realm? You know, the realm of the jhanas is higher, more beautiful. Of course, this is not the end because the jhanas are sankharas as well. That's sankara dukkha. But at least you're getting your first taste of seeing that what you viewed and perceived as happiness is indeed suffering. In the suttas, the Buddha said, what the putrachanas, the ordinary people, say is happiness the Aryas say, is suffering. Pleasures of the world, seeing a baby born, seeing a young, nice flower, seeing waterfalls, hearing a symphony, well played. You should have been there. All of those pleasures of the world, which people delighted, which people cherish, which people celebrate, the Aryas say, just such a lot of suffering. Why do they say that? Because they've seen something more. They've been outside of jail and all the prison concerts, all the prison displays of what prisons get up to, they've seen that freedom is something much more valuable, much more beautiful. And compared to all of that, inside the jail, what's outside? is just so much more beautiful. What you're doing there, you see just, you see in the first glimpse that how you were deceived and you couldn't see it. That you were caught up in the body, you are caught up in sight, you are caught up in all the other five senses. How much of your life is caught up with these five senses? Trying to get happiness with what you see. Trying to Beautify the monastery, beautify your garden, paint this, put flowers here, do the, up this garden. Do we really want a beautiful monastery? Or do we want beautiful minds in our monks? Do we really want to just to have beautiful chanting? Or do we want to have the Dhamma seen in the mind of our monks? Do we really want to have great food? Or do we want to have the the Dhamma food inside. All those things in the world, we spent so much time on them, so much effort on them, and it's hopeless. So the whole purpose of this Dhamma is actually to get into a, well, not the whole purpose, but first purpose, is get into a jhana and just see this five cents well is just not worth anything at all. It's dukkha. Even in its very best, it's dukkha. It's hopeless. Even heaven realms are dukkha compared to what you see in jhanas. That starts to make you make the mind sort of doubt these opinions and ideas of what is sukha, what is dukkha in this realm. When you start to see that these five senses are inherently dukkha, then it's not that much more to infer that the sixth sense also, the mind, is no different 
than sight, sound, smell, taste or touch. Mind knows mind objects. Those mind objects come and go. Happiness, suffering, joy, pain in the mind. You have, get into a second jhana. You know what happens when you get into a second jhana? Afterwards, afterwards you look at first jhana, the most blissful experience you ever had before. The suffering. And that should really sort of shock you. The most blissful, happy, amazing experience you've had in your life from the perspective of a second jhana is now looked upon as being dukkha. You start to see, even with the mind, the happiness is relative. That which one takes to be joy comes and goes. When one starts to see that, one sees that the mind is no different than any other senses. And it works, it keeps on going because of grasping onto the idea that somehow, even in the mind, one can get beautiful happiness, peace, everlasting. That is fantasy. You're in denial about the nature of the mind. You truly see that the mind sense is basically the same as the other five senses, only a bit more refined. Then one will even get nibida towards mind objects and the mind. That's why the Buddha taught Satipatthana, see the body, see Vedana, all the six Vedanas. Each one of them the same, see jitta, see the mind objects. These are just things which rise and pass away. Because they rise and pass away, the mind rises and passes away, the objects of mind rise and pass away. Satipatthana Sutta. Seeing that, it gives you nibida towards this whole thing called the mind. You see, it's dukkha. Whatever arises, that is suffering. It's really something to see first jhana as suffering, as dukkha. That should be enough to sort of <coughs> to give you nibida towards the whole six senses, towards the whole five candas. We just chanted, from Nibida comes Viraga, from Viraga we Muti, free from all these things. That Gata, which I said at the beginning of this talk, Yang Kinchi Dukang Samboti, just whatever suffering, Dukkha, comes about, Sabbang Vinyana Pachaya, all of that is because is caused by being conscious, mind conscious, eye conscious, ear conscious, nose, tongue, body conscious. Vinyanasa nirodhana, from the complete cessation of all consciousness, nati dukkasa sambhavo, there is no more dukkha arising. That's powerful in the Sutta Nipata. What they're actually saying is something which I keep on hammering here. Consciousness is the cause of dukkha. It's dependent origination, if you wish. Not just craving, but consciousness itself whether you crave or not. That's why I sometimes ask a question to find out how people understand Dhamma. Sometimes I ask this of senior monks. And they say, does an arahat experience dukkha? And a lot of people say, oh no, no, an arahat, sort of, you know, they're free from dukkha, they don't experience dukkha. And then I know they haven't seen the Dhamma. An arahat experiences Dukkha. If they are still conscious, haven't parinibbanaed yet, then they experience dukkha because they know that consciousness causes dukkha. To see is to suffer, to hear, to, to smell, to taste, 
to feel in the body, to know in the mind, is dukkha. That's what we just chanted in Atalakana Sutta. Whatever consciousness, close, far away, refined, gross, I forget all the other words which they said in that Natalakana Sutta, all of that. <coughs> not me, not mine, not a self. Whatever arises is suffering. And consciousness arises with the coming together of, what is it, the eye base and uh, eye objects comes consciousness, vijnana. It's vijnana is dependent upon those things. Vijnana, whether it's mind, coming together of the mind base and mind objects, then you get vijnana. All of these are dependent. And vijnana creates dukkha. So that makes it should be obvious that arahats experience dukkha. If they're conscious, they experience dukkha, which is why the sister Wajiri, the bhikkhuni arahat, in the bhikkhuni sangyuta, when it was challenged by Mara about who she was, and she said that there is no being here. And she gave the simile of the chariot. If you take the chariot apart, there's nothing left. The word chariot doesn't go to the ground of all chariots. You take it apart, there's nothing left. Just assemblage of parts in the same way that this is just an assemblage of candors. Nothing more than just candors, she was saying. She was saying that all she experiences, the description of an enlightened being, what it's like, this was like an interview with an arahat. You know, what they say, what's it like to be a monk? What's it like to live in the monastery? What's it like to be an arahat? And she said, it's just dukkha arising, and dukkha passing away. Experiencing dukkha. But knowing that the cause of that dukkha, because seeing it all as dukkha, there's no hope to try and salvage something from samsara. There's no hope of trying to salvage something from the five candors, some little bit of body somewhere, some little bit of Vedana somewhere, some one of the sense bases, a little bit of Sanya, Sankara, some little bit of mind which isn't affected by Dukkha. She couldn't find any. Neither could the Arahats or the Aryas. Because of that, the seeing the whole as riddled with Dukkha, if that is your perception, it will become your view. The consequence of that view, as I'm sure you can follow logically if you haven't experienced that view, is that letting go happens. It's not that a person does the letting go. There is no one in here to do anything. Letting go happens because the cause of attachment, the craving, is seen as hopeless. There is nothing to crave for. Dukkha all the way. Why would anyone crave for dukkha? You only crave because you think there might be some happiness there. Or you think it is complete happiness, or at least mostly happiness, or a little bit of happiness. Seeing in reality, in terms of Sankara Dukkha, it's 100% Dukkha. There's only one consequence of that possible, which is Nibbida. It's the mind completely turns, turns away from any hope, any wanting, any craving, any possibility that one can find anything in this world at all or any other world, realms of form, realms of mind, realms of formless realms. You see, wherever there's consciousness, there has to be suffering. It turns away. And from that turning away, that's called Nibida. 
if that is maintained, the Nibbida allows things to fade away. The whole interest in the world fades, disappears. The only interest left is That's the end of the talk today on Dukkha. Any questions, comments? <laughs> okay. I just going to say that the nice sutta was the, uh, said that when once the arising of any sort of five aggregates, uh, you actually get the uh, nibbida to watch the five aggregates. Okay, yeah. You say when you watch the arising of the five aggregates, you get nibbida towards upadana. Yep. Nibbida towards it means Upadana stops. When Upadana stops, then the cause of five aggregates stops. Okay, the san- okay, the Sankara Dukkha you were saying that someone suggested it was the Dukkha associated with the second uh, of the factors of the eightfold of the dependent origination. That's actually be very interesting because that would be that that Sankara Dukkha is a cause of Vijnana, which is a cause of Dukkha, <laughs> They're rolling around each other. So that's uh, possible as well, but the Sankara of the Dependent origination being basically the doer, the chaitana, which uh, creates the causes for future uh, rebirth, future consciousness. Yeah, the doer, and that's that is suffering as well. The controller, the will. That's the what I was referring to in earlier in the talk is that craver, you know, craving. Sort of, you know, we we want to do this. We want to to try and find the, the sweet um, chili, even though we know there's no sweet chili there, just to do something. It's a craving. It's also the craving of being, because being is caught up with doing. And doing is part of being. But yeah, the, the doer is suffering. and That uh, suffering is very seen. When, if you've always got the doer around, you can't realise just how much suffering it is. Sometimes people like to exert their will and get a lot of pleasure they feel out of cultivating their will and controlling. But all of you know in your meditation that the more you get rid of the doer, the more freedom you have. And if you can get rid of the doer completely and you know how to get rid of the doer completely, the doer gets disappears in the first jhana, or actually completely in the second jhana, but first jhana most of the doer is gone. And to see that happening, just to see that also the jhanas are happy because there's no more doing. There's, there's no more things to do, no more things to construct, nothing to seek. There's actually a con- sense of real contentment there, real fullness, instead of always having to do something more. When you get fed up with doing, are you fed up with work? going to the kitchen and cooking for the monks or sweeping up or building. I'm fed up with giving interviews. I always have to do this and do that. You know, you want to do things to get rid of things. It's marvellous to actually to stop all the doing. Sometimes even if you don't have to give interviews, you don't have to be in the kitchen, you don't have to clean the toilet, just sit in your hut and start doing something else. If you're not actually sitting in your hut doing it, you just cross-legged, your mind meditating, again, more doing. Stop all this doing business. So I think it's actually a good, interesting idea that Sankara Dukkha is the Dukkha from doing. So see if you can stop. Thank you. I'm going to stop now. <laughs>